Hello and welcome. Well, life after the birth of a baby is never really the same. And with good reason, as your focus as a mum is on the health and well-being of the new human being that you have created and brought into the world. Now, following the initial six to eight week post-birth period, many mums do wish to start getting out and about with their lives and adapting to a new normal. And as part of this new normal, you have to adapt your lifestyle uh, and the changes to your body that has undergone, and that being your pelvic floor, which is what we're here to discuss today. To do so, we welcome our special guest, Taryn Watson, pelvic health physiotherapist who has a master's degree in women's health physiotherapy, and she's also the owner of and founder of Right Fit Physio. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> now, lots to talk about on this subject, but before we sort of get into the nitty gritty, now we published your article and the title is Pelvic Floor Exercises Before and After Birth. Now, for someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you please give us an overview of what it's about and just tell us you now what inspired you to write it? Yes, so um, I, I wrote it um, about pelvic floor exercises and why they're important during pregnancy. Yeah. Um, wrote about um, how the pelvic floor can be affected during pregnancy, but also with different births, because um, obviously a cesarean birth versus a vaginal birth will affect your pelvic floor um, in different ways. Uh -huh. And um, and then I also wrote about um, how to rehabilitate your pelvic floor afterwards, um, how to know if you've got any injuries and then what to do about it. Um, and yeah, I was in, inspired to, to write this and, and the, the whole reason behind um, what I do with FitRide and what I do um, in my career as a, as a women's health physio um, is that I really want to help women be more proactive with their pelvic floor health rather than be reactive. And I, I, um, I just feel like there's over the, the 12 years that I've worked in, in obstetrics, there seems to be this big discrepancy between what um, what sort of um, medical care and um, and um, you know well-being care is given to the baby so in pregnancy it's all about mum yes um, and then postnatally um, you go to all these checkups and you spoke before about you know that magical eight, six to eight week mark yes. <laughs> quite a long time, six to eight weeks you know to, to sort of be, be left be left hanging and then six to eight weeks you know, you, it's sort of like, okay, well, I'll wait for those checkups to go to before I do anything. And, and then you go to them and 95% of what they go through at those checkups with the, the child health nurse, the obstetrician or the GP, yep. um, the pediatrician, it's about the baby. And um, it's, it's, you know, relatively unusual to have very much um, physical assessment done on, of the mother at all. And if, if it is, um, then it's usually done by people who aren't actually um, checking the pelvic floor and the abdominal muscles because that's not their area of specialty. Um, their area of specialty was the birth and the baby's well-being. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm very passionate about making sure that um, maternal health is prioritised just as much as um, as the baby's health in this pre and postnatal period. Absolutely. And that's what this chat is all about. Now there's lots to cover. So let's just start initially just for the question, you know, what are pelvic floor muscles and where are these mysterious muscles located in our body? <laughs> it's, it's hard, isn't it? Because it's not a muscle group that you can see um, externally. And um, so the, the pelvic floor, I think sometimes people think of it as being like one sphincter sort of squeezy muscle like a valve, um, but it's actually a really big muscle group compared to what, what you might think. So if you're, if you're sitting, yeah. <laughs> listening to this, um, there's the, there's the pubic bone at the front, mm -hmm. the tailbone at the back. Yep. And then if you think about where your sit bones are on the side, yep. um, that whole area underneath that joins between those bony points, yep. um, that's the pelvic floor. So it's sort of um, shaped a bit like, a hammock? <laughs> Is it like a hammock? Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a hammock on a bit of an angle. <laughs> um, yep. and, um, and went because the pelvis is on a bit of an angle. Um, so when it contracts, it actually, rather than being a squeeze, it's like a, um, it closes off um, the, the space between it. So it's yeah. like a U shape, kind of like that. So rather than being a hammock, it's kind of a, a U shape. <laughs> um, and between the two sides is the urethra, the vagina and the 
anus, the rectum. Yes. And um, what, what ends up happening when you contract it is that it closes those spaces together, um, should close the space together and pulls forward towards the, the pubic bone. So okay. it's a little bit different to what people might think. <laughs> so what do pelvic floor muscles do? And like in general, why are they so important? Yeah, they have some pretty important functions. Um, the, so because they have that um, inward, forward, upward sort of drawing motion like that, um, they close off the passages between them. Um, they they um, uh, increase tension there and, and decrease the space there. So that would um, squeeze around the urethra and around the rectum. So that stops us from weeing and pooing when we don't want to, which is quite an important, <laughs> important function. Um, they also, the muscles and the connective tissue that makes up the, the pelvic floor and surrounding it, that's what supports your pelvic organs. So the bladder, the uterus and the bowel. Um, and uh, so that helps to prevent what's called prolapse. So um, if one of those organs is not well supported, one or more of those organs is not well supported, it can descend down um, into the vagina and it can um, cause what's called prolapse, which is like, uh, can be felt as like a heavy feeling in the vagina or a lump or a bulge there. Um, so that's something that's very common and pelvic floor plays a big part in that. So the pelvic floor also has a sexual function. Um, the muscles should be the right tone, so not too tense and tight. Um, with muscles in the pelvic floor that are held on all the time like this um, don't work very well, but also can, um, can cause pain and discomfort with sex. Um, and or if or the opposite, if the pelvic floor muscles don't have good tone in them and are, are laxer than we would like, um, then, uh, the, then you can have decreased sensation with sex. Um, then also um, the, the last thing is that the pelvic floor is part of that cylinder of support around the, uh -huh. the abdomen and the trunk. So um, together with the deep back muscles and the, um, the abdominal muscles and the diaphragm, that helps to, to support um, the lower back and the pelvis. Great. So then how is the pelvic floor affected by pregnancy and what are some of the symptoms that women can experience in particular with pelvic floor disorder then? Yeah, so um, the, pel the pelvic floor is affected in two main ways with pregnancy. Um, mm -hmm. I think the main one that we all would think about is the, the physical load on the pelvic floor. You yep. know, you've got, the, um, you've got the, the pelvic floor sitting directly underneath where the baby is growing. Yep. So um, that, would, that would be more so the case during the second and third trimesters. Uh -huh. But, um, but that, that increased physical load um, puts a lot of extra stress on the pelvic floor. And then secondarily, um, there's the hormones that are released um, right from the start of pregnancy. So this can affect, this means that the pelvic floor can be affected right from conception. Um, that uh, it, the main one is called relaxin, the main hormone. And it does a really good job of preparing our body for childbirth and making everything more flexible and more able to move apart between the two sides of the pelvic floor to give birth. But, you know, at the same time, that um, is not so great for the support of the organs and, um, and for, um, for the, the uh, maintaining continence and things. So in, in answer to the, the second part of your question, that's why... Um, things like prolapse and in particular incontinence can, um, can come about during yeah. pregnancy. So who typically treats pelvic floor disorders then? What sort of practitioners? It's, it's usually um, women's health physiotherapists. Um, more correctly, we're called pelvic health physiotherapists because we do treat men and children and things too. Um, so uh, pelvic health physiotherapists are physios who've done um, extra training. Um, often it's a master's degree like what I've done um, in um, in physiotherapy to, to learn how to do pelvic floor assessments and, and, um, and to treat a variety of different pelvic health issues. Um, gynecologists obviously um, uh, can often do vaginal examinations and they are the ones who um, manage um, the same sort of things as we do, um, prolapse and incontinence and things. It's just that um, the musculoskeletal side of it and the rehab side of it after pregnancy, that's where um, women's health or, or pelvic health physiotherapists are the, the professionals who are best placed to do that. Okay. And so how is the pelvic floor affected then? You mentioned about the two different types of birth, the natural versus cesarean birth. So I'd love to, to dissect some of this information because I've just thought at the back of my mind that it would only affect 
a natural birth, but that's not the case. It, it can actually affect um, women who have cesarean births also. Can you tell us a little yes. bit about this? Well, to start with, um, a lot of the, the issues that occur with the pelvic floor, it's actually occurring because of those changes in pregnancy that I was talking about before. So, yeah. um, you know, you don't just have the birth um, affecting the pelvic floor. You've got the, the whole pregnancy with the increasing load and the effect of the hormones um, having a, a part to play in that. So, uh -huh. so obviously that's, that's part of it, but that doesn't discriminate between whether you, have a, you end up having a cesarean section or not. And the pelvic floor, I think I was sort of saying before, but it does mm -hmm. that U shape. Yep. The space in between that is called the levator hiatus. And that space, it gradually increases during pregnancy to prepare for childbirth. And like I said, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't know if you're going to have a cesarean. So, of course, um, that you, space, yes. Yeah. Your body just does what it does. Yeah. That's right. So, the space between the two sides of the pelvic floor would be increasing regardless of whether. Um, you have a cesarean. And then there's this big subgroup of people who have a cesarean who've actually gone through labor, right? So had, a, had an emergency cesarean. So um, sometimes research that's done on, um, on pelvic floor issues post-birth is done on, it, it um, divides people into whether they labored or whether they did not. So not cesarean versus vaginal birth, but elective cesarean with no, you know, elective cesarean, no, no labor or a labor that ended in an emergency cesarean or a vaginal birth, because um, especially if you get to the point of being fully dilated and pushing and then end up with a cesarean, you pretty much have exactly the same, um, you know, uh, potential damage to the pelvic floor um, as if, if you had a vaginal birth. So um, yes, it's very important for people who um, have had a, a cesarean to know that um, it's not a given, that they will definitely not have pelvic floor dysfunction. And how is the treatment different between the three different types of cases that you've, that you've just mentioned? Um, does it differ or, or not at all? Um, from a point of view of a, a pelvic floor assessment afterwards and pelvic floor rehabilitation program, it, it wouldn't necessarily differ between them, except it, it would um, depend on how they presented. So, um, it might mean that, you know, there might be more um, birth injuries if they did have a vaginal birth. So then we would treat that. But, you know, in general, we, there's no sort of golden rule of if you had a cesarean, this is how we rehabilitate your pelvic floor. If you, had a, um, if you went through labour and then had a cesarean, this is how. And if you had a vaginal birth, this is how. Um, there are definitely differences with, with what um, we would do for rehab for cesarean, um, like scar uh -huh. therapy and um, assessment of, of the scar and, um, you know, the, the sort of advice we would give with regards to getting back into physical activity and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but from a pelvic floor rehab point of view, pretty similar between them both. It's just that we might find more injuries um, that we need to rehabilitate after a vaginal birth. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, I believe there have been some interesting <laughs> word of the day, um, interesting, using that a lot, but yeah. studies about the benefits of women doing regular pelvic floor exercises during pregnancy. Can you share some of these outcomes of those studies with us? Yes, um, there's been over over many years, there's been a lot of studies that have um, looked at pelvic floor exercises during pregnancy and, mm -hmm. um, and generally found that those who do pelvic floor exercises in pregnancy um, do have decreased rate of um, of incontinence during pregnancy and um, and better better outcomes from a pelvic floor and incontinence point of view afterwards. Uh -huh. um, obviously, there's a lot of factors that come into that though, like um, you know what what ends up happening with the birth and things like that. Um, but uh, then there's there was also some interesting studies done on those who did who regularly did. Um, aqua aerobics during pregnancy and obviously there's a lot of other studies done on general exercise in pregnancy as well regardless of pelvic floor exercise and how how beneficial it is during pregnancy during the delivery and later on in life for those who exercise regularly and meet those um, guidelines in pregnancy but the, the study about the um, aqua fitness in pregnancy yeah which i look because that's what that's part of what my business does um is uh that the um 
the, the women who did that regularly in pregnancy had um, uh, significantly better birth outcomes from the point of view of like needing assistance with the delivery with forceps and vacuum and, um, and perineal tearing, which is um, tearing to that area between the vagina and the anus during pregnancy, during um, that second, the pushing stage of labour. Yeah. yeah. So how often during pregnancy should um, a woman then be uh, can, um, sort of practising the, the exercises um, is it something daily? Um, cause I, I, I've yeah. read that you shouldn't, um, you don't want to over-exercise a muscle either. Is, is that right? Or did I misread that? Maybe? Uh, yes. I think, I think it's, um, it's probably, uh, the same as before in that there's no general recipe to this, but, okay. uh, yep. and, it would, and it would depend on whether somebody, um, presented with a very weak pelvic floor that needs a lot of work or whether uh. they presented um, you know, needing more endurance and um, or whether they presented with an overactive pelvic floor, which we sort of touched on before. But um, I think probably what you're referring to is if somebody um, did have a tendency towards an overactive pelvic floor that tends to be too tight and they were given a brochure that said, do pelvic floor exercises three times a day, see if you can hold for 10 seconds, you know, um, rest for five seconds, do it again. They're likely to just make themselves more tight and not realise that they're not letting go well in between each one. So that can be quite detrimental, as you can imagine, um, not just for sexual function and things that we were talking about before, but can you imagine if you're going into a vaginal birth and, you know, into a labour with um, where you've really, really worked your muscles up and up and up and up, but you haven't, um, haven't really uh, focused on, on learning how to let go through the full range. Um, that's obviously going to, um, could have some implications for a vaginal birth as well. So very important to make sure that you're doing the exercises regularly, but that you're, you know that you're doing them correctly. Now, in general, then, a pelvic floor exercise is easy to do. You know, I mean, how do you learn how to do them? Um, as you just mentioned about the pamphlet. Um, so, I mean, how, how can you actually learn how to, how to do this? Yeah, I know it's, it's, um, it's hard because um, we know that we should be doing them. There's heaps of good research that shows that they can prevent these things like, you know, incontinence affects one in three women and prolapse one in two women. And we know that pelvic floor exercises are the gold standard management for, for both of those. But we also know from research that if you're given a pamphlet or you're just taught verbally, that you've got a 50-50 chance of, of doing it correctly or doing it wrong, doing it incorrectly. Um, and if you're doing it incorrectly, you might at best be wasting your time, but at worst, you might be actually doing it in a way that pushes down and potentially makes things worse. Or, or like I said before, tightens it up more um, when that's not what you need. So um, yeah, it's, um, it, it is hard to know if you're doing it correctly. Um, I mean, uh, there, there is a, you can, if you just, you know, we were talking before about where it is and between the pubic bone and the sit yep. bones and the tail. If you actually put your hand underneath you <laughs> and felt that area of the perineum, you should be able to, if you did a squeeze and a lift, you should be able to feel that area underneath you um, lifting away from your hand. Mm -hmm. And that's a good starting point because if you did that and you felt anything being pushed down into your hand, that's a pretty good um, a warning sign that hang on that what I'm doing is not actually a pelvic floor upward movement I better get this checked out but um, so, so if you've got it checked out sorry what were you gonna say yeah I'm just interested because you're mentioning about the lift and the squeeze so it's not just a squeezing as you mentioned it's a hammock so it has to lift before you squeeze or is it a squeeze then lift how does that work uh, sort of concurrently it sort of should squeeze and lift concurrently um but uh yes because it's it's rather than being a, a squeezing muscle although you know parts of it there are sphincters involved in in the pelvic floor complex but if you think about it in that u shape from the pubic bone around and back it is a closing off and a pulling up so um so yes when we if we test it as a as a physiotherapist who tests it we can do that in two ways um, well, a few different ways, but two main ways. Mm -hmm. One is the the more um, the less invasive way of testing, you know, without doing a vaginal examination. You can get a real-time ultrasound onto your lower tummy. And if you've got a relatively full bladder, you can see the bladder on the screen. And then you can see the base of the bladder being elevated when you lift the pelvic floor and go back down when you let it go. So that shows, that doesn't show the squeeze, um, but it does show the lift. Um, so that would be a good way of also assessing whether somebody is in that category of 
inadvertently bearing down when they think they're doing the right thing. It also shows endurance and, it, and it's really good verb, um, uh, visual feedback for the woman, for the person. Um, so that's, that's good. That's a really good screening assessment. But okay. there's a lot that a real-time ultrasound can't show that a vaginal exam can show. Of course. So preferentially, postnatally, especially after a vaginal birth, we tend to recommend having a vaginal exam done where possible because that will show the strength, if there's any prolapse, the tone, pain, all sorts of things as well. So what would be, I guess, a general test for anyone watching and listening um, to give them give us an indication to do our own test right now as to what would be considered to be a, a weaker pelvic floor to a stronger pelvic floor. If we were to do the 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 lift and squeeze as an example, what would be considered um, if we're to hold it? Um, what would be dis, so um, yeah? What would be the difference between the two? Um, so if you were doing that test that I was talking about before where, you, where you're sort of sitting on your hand and feeling the lift away from your hand. Yep. Um, See if I can do that. Hang on. As you're doing. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'll, go. I'll do it too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Put your hand underneath. Yep. <laughs> sitting on it. Yep. Um, and, and if you can feel like, yeah, between the, the pubic bone and the tailbone, if you can squeeze and lift and feel that lifting away, I would I say test. I've test got, I've got a lot of padding. Aaron, I've got a lot of padding, so. <laughs> right, right in between the sit bones. <laughs> yep, okay. Um, yep, I'm just trying to manoeuvre all my padding for the protection of my pelvic floor. Yep, okay, move, okay, here we go. Yep, keep going. Hi, everyone at home, hope you're doing the same. Yep. <laughs> um, so, so if you can do that, you the first thing to test for is can you feel it let go again? And if you can, um, equal and opposite let go then maybe start thinking about how long you can hold for. <laughs> so I might need you, an internal examination because at the moment I can't, I can't. Well, you'd be in the, in the 50%, you know, it's not unusual to not feel that. But if, if somebody's listening at home and they could feel that, that lifting away from their hand, then, the, then you could count how many seconds, like start with maybe three, can you feel the let go afterwards? And if you can, then you'd wait another five or 10 seconds to rest and then try it again, see if you can hold for five seconds and then see if you can feel the relax afterwards. Um, and, and then, you know, up to 10 or 20 seconds and re repeat how many of those you can do. See, Taryn, um, as you know, I'm practicing this, I can feel that I'm trying to lift um, and I can feel my quads, my, my, my legs tensing. I can feel my buttocks we, the, all of these additional muscles around that part of the body shouldn't be affected. It should really only just be this internal shift. Is that right? Because I'm feeling yeah, all these other muscles. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm this, this movement here, but everything else around it is moving because of it. And that's not unusual. Like that is, that's almost always what we find with women who are, are learning to do their pelvic floor. It's almost always that the glutes, you know, okay. the, the glute muscles come on. Um, the yeah. upper tummy sucks in, your shoulders go up, you know. We spend a lot of time <laughs> teaching women how to breathe with, concurrently with it as well. Because a lot of people, I don't know what you found when you tried that just then, Rachel, but a lot of people find the, that It wasn't very good at it. There you go. That's what I think. <laughs> Well, when you go to lift your pelvic floor, um, well, I've got a question for you, Rachel. When you go to lift your pelvic floor, do you want to breathe in or out? Um, I want to breathe in. Yeah, and a lot of people do. But actually, we try. We spend quite a bit of time teaching women how to breathe out when they lift. Wow, the that's floor. hard because naturally yeah. your body is the fact that you're you're wanting to have this inward and upward mo motion. So, yes. And once again, think so about it. here you go. Yeah, think about it this way though. Your diaphragm, right, at the bottom of your lungs, mm -hmm. that has to go down when you breathe in, okay, to let the air in, breathe in, the diaphragm goes down. Yes. And so if you're then trying to lift every time with the pelvic floor against that pressure of the diaphragm coming down, you're working against the pressure. <laughs> if what, what should happen is that the pelvic floor should work in conjunction with the diaphragm. It's a little bit so like breathe. this, isn't it? Having to exactly do all these different, not playing the drum. Yeah. yeah. So breathe in, Ooh. diaphragm should. Uh, pelvic floor should relax, breathe out, it should come up. And it's, it's not wrong to do it the other way. It's just that so many women can't do it the other way. And guess what? A cough is a breath out. A, a lift is a breath out. You know, all these things that cause leakage a lot of the time are a breath out. And there's a huge amount of women who can only contract their pelvic floor on a breath in. <laughs> so 
This is um, really fascinating how much work and internal work you need to do to have a strong pelvic floor. It's not just a squeezing motion. There is a lot involved in it and it shouldn't involve all the other muscles around your body also. But um, just to clarify, a stronger, uh, a weaker pelvic floor would be holding it, say, for three seconds. A stronger pelvic floor is around that 10 second um, time period. Rather than talking about strength, that's talking about endurance. So poorer endurance would be like, yeah, one or two seconds and better endurance would be like 20, 30 seconds um, to hold for. But strength is a measure of the squeeze pressure. So that strength can only be um, assessed with an internal examination and that's usually graded one to five or zero to five. Okay, cool. So, I mean, what are the two things generally that occur to make women more prone to pelvic floor dysfunction um, maybe before, during and after pregnancy? There's a lot of things that can come into play. Genetics, um, suffering from chronic constipation, that puts a lot of extra strain, chronic coughing and sneezing, um, obesity, that, you know, we were talking about the pressure during pregnancy, but if you carry extra weight all the time and not just in pregnancy, that's exactly the same. Um, and uh, sometimes exercise routines, um, you know, what you choose to do for exercise can have um, an impact on your pelvic floor. Um, uh, we know that um, high impact exercise, like, um, you know, sports that involve running and jumping and things like that, um, you're more likely to have pelvic floor dysfunction. Well, you're more likely to have um, stress incontinence, which is leaking with um, exertion. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's quite a few different things that can increase your risk. Um, when it comes to childbirth, there's a few things that can increase your risk as well. Um, in a vaginal birth, um, if you had forceps, that's a big increased risk. Um, if you had a very long or a very short stage where you, of pushing, you know, um, if you're there, if you, the baby's head is there on the pelvic floor for a long time, or if it comes down very quickly, um, that can cause damage. Um, and then if you had a big baby, like over four kilos or nine pounds, that's increased risk. Um, so, or, or if you had a, um, a bad tear, um, like a, a tear that went through towards the anal sphincters that, that can increase the risk of dysfunction as well. And what about the mother's, um, age, her height and those types of things, can that affect it at all? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was talking about forceps before, um, which is the, uh, one of the number one risk factors for damage to the pelvic floor and it can actually um, uh, be associated with um, a tear of the muscle away from the bone behind the pubic bone, which is quite a common injury that we assess for as pelvic health physios. Um, and age is one of the other ma major um, factors that increase the risk of that. It's called a levator avulsion. Um, so over 30, you're more at risk. Over 35, you're more at risk again. Over 40, you're more at risk again um, because your connective tissue changes over, over your lifespan. And um, unfortunately, our connective tissue is just not as elastic and easily um, stretched as it, as it is when we're in our early 20s. <laughs> So how can having a stronger pelvic floor assist um, during the per, uh, birth and then and, and, and following it? W what is going to change in the body that um, with that, that stronger muscles, um, they're going to prevent any of those, those, those terrible things from happening to the body? Well, look, during childbirth, during a vaginal birth, there's not a lot that you can do to prevent, um, you know, if, if there's going to be things that happen like... Um, uh, a shoulder getting stuck, the baby's shoulder getting stuck or forceps being used or something. You know, there, there's a lot of things that are sort of above the control of what we can do with pelvic floor training and things, you know. Um, but if you have gone through your pregnancy, training your pelvic floor to know how to contract, getting good, good tone and good awareness, good awareness of how to let go as well, then you're setting yourself up really well that after the birth, no matter what's gone on during the birth, you're starting at a point where your rehab is going to be easier because you're not starting from learning from scratch. Okay. Now you've mentioned earlier, uh, earlier sorry, as well, that you stated that it's being pregnant rather than the way that you deliver that is shown in the research to be uh, the biggest pr uh, predictor of having pelvic floor dysfunction uh, down the track. Now, can you explain this just a little bit further? Yeah, um, just just in a nutshell, when you get to, um, you know, 20, 10 or 20 years after your birth, 
um, your, your risk profile of whether or not you have incontinence, um, stress incontinence in particular, which like I said before, is the type of incontinence with leaking on exertion, like coughing and sneezing and jumping and that sort of thing. Um, if you look down the track, um, 10 or 20 years, it's pretty much the, the risk profile is whether you've had a baby or not had a baby, not necessarily whether you had a cesarean or a vaginal birth. It's have you been pregnant and carried a baby to full term or have you not? So in the earlier year, in the earlier time after a delivery, you're, um, you're more likely to have um, incontinence. Uh, um, usually, you know, the most studies show you're more likely to have incontinence um, if you've had a vaginal birth in the, the early time period, but down the track, it kind of evens out. Um, prolapse is a little bit more of a vaginal birth specific issue, but it's not. Um, it's not. Uh, there are definitely people who don't have a vaginal birth who still have prolapse. It's just that the incontinence, that kind of is an even playing field down the track. Uh huh. And why should pelvic floor injuries be treated the same as a sporting injury? This is something that you mentioned in the article, which I found quite fascinating. So could you maybe expand just briefly on this for a moment? Yes. And on that point, I just think that there are so many women that I meet who society seems to tell them that if you had a, a vaginal birth or a natural birth, yeah. you know, um, rather than a cesarean, that the recovery should be really easy. Um, and that you should be able to get back into things quite quickly and you should be able to look after your toddler quickly and things like that. But I think what, what society doesn't talk about so much is the fact that a baby coming through the pelvis um, it is a, a, it can cause a lot of injuries that are the same as sporting injuries, you know, Incredible. tissue damage. Yeah, like if you if you rolled your ankle really badly and had ligament damage on one side, it's you'd see you know, it's you'd see yeah, physio. Yeah. yeah, of course. There's often a lot of swelling involved afterwards, which is an in indication of, um, of muscle damage, and that's the response to that. And yet we don't treat it necessarily like um, an injury that would be rehabbed. And like I said before, you could, it's not that uncommon to have a muscle tear from the bone, and that would be the same as like you know your Achilles tendon on your, on your heel tearing away from the bone. And if that happened, you'd get a massive amount of rehabilitation and, and guidance with return to exercise. But with pelvic floor, it often isn't even diagnosed, let alone rehabilitated. So, uh huh. So, in that, um, I guess in the, in the prep phase, I mean, what can we do to prepare our pelvic floor muscles for delivery? Then, what can we be doing in the in the early stages of pregnancy, even a pre-pregnancy as well? Yeah, I think the main thing I would say is if you can, if there's any way that you can see a women's health physio, pelvic health physio, to test that you're doing your pelvic floor correctly, that's the number one thing you can do because it's all very well and good to say do your pelvic floor exercises during pregnancy but like I said before you could be doing it in a way that doesn't help or actually makes things worse so everybody's individual but get it checked and then the other thing I would recommend is just trying to be um, as globally strong and fit as you can because we also know that um, if you have weakness around the other muscles you know your, your thigh muscles your glute muscles your tummy muscles um, you know if, if you're globally weak then you'll probably be doing your daily tasks more in a way that strains, you know, uh -huh. lifting from the ground, for example, <laughs> like that rather than somebody who regularly lift, regularly knows, you know, is, is strong in those muscle groups would lift with more ease. And that's going to have a massive difference on um, the amount of strain through your pelvic floor. So it's not just, it's not just um, blinkers on pelvic floor exercises. It's looking at your body as a whole. Overall. Can you keep your body as flexible, strong, um, good endurance and good, good cardiovascular fitness. And that, that will be um, very helpful going into a birth and a, um, the postnatal period as well. And then, um, so just speaking more about that postnatal period, you know, what is the best plan for pelvic floor muscle recovery after giving birth then? So in the first six weeks, um, before you go to that checkup, there's actually yep. quite a lot you can Doing. And if you were, if you knew what your program was for pelvic floor in pregnancy, mm -hmm. you should try and start that straight away after. And it might feel different and you might not be able to do it. But if you have been taught how to, you know, know how to tell how many seconds you can hold um, and not go past that point, and, you know, you might need to modify a bit, but starting that from day one would be great <laughs> within pain limits. Um, and and yeah. giving you, you, you 
your body the chance to understand, I guess, your strengths and weaknesses in that pre-pregnancy and the pregnancy period would be very important, I would think, in, in the, in the post-birth yes. period, would you say? Yeah, definitely, yes. Um, yes, I, I actually, after the birth of my first baby, I created a, a video series called The First Six Weeks because I was so amazed even after working in obstetrics for quite a while before that how little guidance is given in the first six weeks about rehab so there's a lot you can be doing um, especially for your pelvic floor um, and then at about six to eight weeks that's when people usually would um, see a, a pelvic health physio to actually have a reassessment or or an initial assessment if you didn't have it done in pregnancy um, and and work up from there not just pelvic floor but globally as well. This has been a great chat. Now, if you were to summarize, I guess, your key messages for anyone watching and listening, what would they be? Yes. Well, going back to um, what I said at the start is just think, firstly, be proactive about your pelvic floor health rather than being reactive. I really think that I have spent my career just being so saddened by the number of women that have come to see me when problems have got bad and bad enough for somebody to finally say, I think you should, you know, seek help for this. Um, things get fobbed off as being just normal after childbirth. Um, so uh, be proactive, see if you can um, get your pelvic floor assessed even before you have problems <laughs> um, as a prevention strategy and um, get, get little problems seen to before they become big problems in the realm of um, incontinence and prolapse and things because there, there's a lot of good research that shows that we can help. Um, and then, um, yeah, the, the other thing, I guess, is, um, is just to be very aware that the process in, I'm in Western Australia, I assume it's the same across Australia and other places in the world, um, is that you, uh, you go to all these, you know, during your pregnancy, your well-being is checked a lot, probably not pelvic floor necessarily, but your, your, um, your vital signs are taken regularly, you're, you know, you're checked up on a lot. Postnatally, you probably won't be seen very much for the first six weeks and then you'll have quite a few appointments after that in that six to eight week period. And I, I would imagine that 95% of what's done in those sessions is about the baby's health, not the mother's health. Um, and, uh, and probably what's asked of the mother is about mental health, which is really important, um, maybe about contraception and maybe just generally how are you going. And if a woman asked at that point, can I get back into exercise? She's probably told yes, even without having any physical um, assessment of her pelvic floor or abdominal muscles. So, or a global assessment of how strong she is and what her aims and goals need to be. So my, my take home message would just be, know that there are these people out there like me called pelvic health physios. <laughs> know you can see us in pregnancy and you can, and you can see us postnatally and we're the ones that have done extra training specifically to help you and your musculoskeletal recovery um, after, after having a baby and get back into doing the things you love and be able to continue to do them through your life without common problems. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, if anyone's got any questions for you and would like to reach out to you after watching and listening to this, whereabouts can they find you? So um, my company's name is FitRight, um, F-I-T, um, and then capital R-I-G-H-T, FitRight. Um, so on, um, on Instagram and Facebook, it's FitRight Physio. Mm -hmm. um, at Fit Right Physio. Um, and then the website is www.fitright.physio. Um, and there's, um, there's like a contact form on there or you can contact me through the, the Facebook or Instagram pages. I, would, I really love um, uh, people getting in touch and asking questions. Um, um, I, I run a membership group on Facebook where um, new and expectant mums join and, um, and they ask a lot of questions in there. We have you know, regular chats in there with all the members about um, questions to do with exercise and pelvic floor and all that. <laughs> Wonderful. We'll have all of those links in the show notes. Thanks so much for your time. Learned a lot today, Taryn. Um, and look yeah. forward to the opportunity of speaking with you, hopefully again in the future. We'll take care. And in the meantime, stay safe. Thanks again. Yes. Bye. All right. Bye.